as we said earlier today, uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, uh, wherever you're coming from in the world. Um, thanks so much for coming to the Birds and Marine Mammals uh, session here at SCAR. Um, my name is Michelle LaRue, and I will be the convening uh, person for the, the day today. Um, just a couple things to note. Um, I, just, I guess, a new introduction to the new EGBAM team, the expert group on birds and marine mammals. Um, I'm the brand new chief officer, and I am joined here by uh, the deputy chief officer, Ryan Reisinger, and our secretary, Manu Basoy. Um, so welcome, everybody. Um, just a couple other things, uh, just to note that um, the presentations will be about 12 minutes long. If I feel like you might be not quite making the 12 minute mark, um, I'll just give you a heads up at 12 minutes that you have three minutes left. Um, so you'll be going into your, um, your question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please just raise your hand using the raise your hand function at the bottom of the screen. And you're also able to ask questions at any time during the Q&A, or sorry, um, with the Q&A um, functionality at the bottom of the screen as well. Um, and then finally, just to note that we, uh, because we only have seven speakers here, we do have an extra 15 minutes at the end. Um, and so if you have any other questions that weren't addressed or if they pop up um, at some point during um, the session, please feel free to ask them at that point. Um, so again, welcome to Birds and Marine Mammals. And without further ado, I will hand it over to Doug. Uh, okay, share my screen. Thank you so much, Michelle, for that awesome introduction. And we, the community of researchers, are very, very excited about um, uh, EGBAM2 under your esteemed leadership. Okay. Uh, okay, can you see that? Yep, looks great. Okay, uh, we'll get started. All right, well, hello to everyone. Uh, thank you for choosing to join this session. Um, my name is Doug Krauss. I'm a research biologist with the United States Antarctic Marine Living Resources, or AMLAR program, which is part of NOAA Fisheries in the United States, focused on providing scientific advice for the management of Antarctic fisheries. And I'm here today to share with you guys uh, some work that my colleagues and I have undertaken to better understand and update the conservation status of Antarctic fur seals, specifically those within the South Shetland Island archipelago in the Northern Antarctic Peninsula. So Antarctic fur seals are actually one of the best studied pinnipeds anywhere on the planet, and for very good reason. Uh, as large, numerous apex predators, they're important parts of coastal ecosystems, both in the Antarctic and subantarctic. Because they are highly dependent upon the commercial, commercially targeted Antarctic krill, uh, they have also been nominated as a core or key indicator species by the Convention for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, or CAMLAR. Um, and they also provide a good recent example of the importance of intraspecific diversity particularly in peripheral areas of populations when one is trying to manage those populations. And we'll talk a little bit more about that today. Okay, so by way of review, um, Antarctic fur seals were hunted to almost extinction in the 18th and 19th centuries, but they had experienced a steady recovery uh, across the 20th century and ended up uh, reoccupying their entire historical distribution. And based on the best science available in 2014, the current conservation paradigm is that basically there is a single global panmictic population across that range, that it likely recolonized, uh, uh, that recovery recolonized from a relic population that survived hunting near South Georgia Island, and that recovery went on to repopulate the other areas and that the species as a whole, as well as each of the major colonies within that range are either growing stable or at the very least are not in danger of extinction. 
Uh, there are breeding colonies, of course, across that whole range, but the major colonies are spread on southern uh, uh, sub-Antarctic islands across the Indian Ocean uh, at a relatively large colony on Bouvet Island in the South Atlantic at and near South Georgia, uh, which represents by far the largest population within the species, approximately 95% of all pups born. But we're going to focus the rest of this talk on uh, the population within the South Shetland Islands in the Northern Antarctic Peninsula here. So within the South Shetland Islands, the US AMLAR program operates uh, a long-term observation site for Antarctic fur seals. And that's at Cape Sheriff on Livingston Island, which is pictured here. So the objectives that I'm talking about today uh, of our project were to take over 20 years of observational and demographic uh, data that we have from the site at Cape Sheriff, together with a whole bunch of recent research on Antarctic fur seals uh, and reassess the population structure of the species. Also to update the population status of the fur seals within the South Shetlands, which haven't been updated for almost 20 years. And finally, to use our behavioral and demographic data to potentially explore and explain any of the patterns that we see within those population trends. So we'll start with the population structure. Uh, as you can see, there have been a whole suite of recent genetic studies using very large sample sizes and nuclear markers. And they have made a very strong, compelling case that there is not one single uh, global panmectic population, but in fact, at least uh, four distinct subpopulations within the species. Uh, for example, Pijmans et al. used over samples from over 2,000 individuals from eight locations uh, and not only confirmed those four genetically distinct subpopulation locations, but found very high levels of differentiation between them. Additionally, a couple of these studies looked at metrics of genetic diversity and uh, like allelic richness, for example. And what they discovered is that within the South Shetland Islands, you find a similar level of genetic diversity compared with South Georgia, despite the fact that the South Shetlands are two orders of magnitude smaller in their population size. So all of this collectively makes uh, a strong case that South Shetland Islands represent a genetically distinct subpopulation and also that that population harbors very high levels of genetic diversity for the species. So <clears throat> in order to make a crude attempt uh, at, at beginning to look for morphological differences between these subpopulations, we took a very large sample size of uh, animals, all adult female Antarctic fur seals, both from Cape Sheriff and from South Georgia. Um, and these are animals that we had very accurate measurements of standard length and mass. Um, so we matched them all by the time of year of their capture and also the age of the animals, and then we compared them. And the initial analysis indicates that, in fact, uh, animals from Cape Sheriff are significantly longer and significantly larger than those from South Georgia. So this, together with the genetic um, research that we just talked about, as well as some historical information that we were able to uncover in our study, all strongly make the case to reject the current hypothesis of a single panmictic population. But what about the population trends in the South Shetland Islands? Uh, well, <clears throat> um, uh, as described, you can see, uh, well, I should explain the plot. Um, what we've plotted here are every reliable synoptic count of Antarctic fur seal pups that were conducted within the South Shetlands. And the ones that covered the entire archipelago rep are represented in that gold line up the top. Um, and then we've also plotted counts from the two largest colonies within the South Shetland Islands, Cape Sheriff here in blue and the St. Telmo Islets in green. Those two colonies alone make up between 65 and 80% of all pups born within the South Shetlands. As you can see, they, uh, the area experienced a recovery through the 19, late 1900s all the way up into the early 2000s. Population was growing very quickly, but that recovery tapered in the early 2000s and has now turned into a very steep decline. In fact, at Cape Sheriff, we've seen a decrease in pup production each year 
um, of 86% just since 2007. So these are extremely rapid, catastrophic uh, rates of collapse within the population. They are indeed in danger of extinction. Um, and you just don't see rates of decrease like this without some serious perturbations to the system. So what's going on? Well, probably several factors all acting in concert. And one of them is definitely coming from the top down. Uh, at Cape Sheriff, starting in the late 1990s, likely driven by uh, rapid climatic warming in the region, a resident population, a seasonally resident population of leopard seals, mostly large adult females, uh, established and then quickly grew at Cape Sheriff. And many of those animals were targeting Antarctic fur seal pups as a significant portion of their diet. Their numbers increased all the way through the early 2010s. And the end result is that over the last decade, uh, we've seen an average of almost 70% of all pups born at Cape Sheriff are consumed by leopard seals. Uh, so that's very strong top-down population control. But what about bottom-up drivers? Well, one useful um, index, if you will, of habitat quality for Antarctic fur seals are the foraging trip lengths of adult females who are rearing a pup during the summer. And we know from a lot of research that the longer those foraging trips are, the worse the outcomes are for the pups in terms of the growth and also in terms of their survival. Um, and so we looked at 20 years of data, over 2,900 trips uh, over 20 years, and found that, in fact, foraging trip lengths for these animals are getting longer over time. But you may also notice that there is a big uh, gap there in the data, or there is a gap in the data, uh, which are the foraging trip lengths from 2003, which are plotted, plotted over here uh, on side B. This was an extremely anomalous year. Um, it's over five and a half standard deviations outside of the mean. And in that particular year, we feel it was extremely anomalous and, and driven by very unusual combination of climatological and oceanographic factors. But we were loath to exclude it. So we plotted here with and without that data included. And if you include the data, the trend disappears. But it did help us see something else. So within this plot, the solid line represents the long-term mean forging trip length for these adult females. The dotted lines on each side represent one standard deviation. And what you need to remember is that although long foraging trips are bad for the outcomes of these animals, short foraging trip lengths are very good. Uh, they represent uh, positive and increased uh, metrics across the spectrum. And the first half of the study, the first 10 years, 50% of years were unusually short or unusually good. Basically, every other year, they're having good foraging conditions. However, in the second half of the study, that's never happened again. And each individual year's average is above the long-term mean. So whichever way you look at it, the summer foraging habitat quality for these animals uh, is getting worse over time. But what about what's going... Okay, thanks. What about what's going on uh, in the... Uh, for over the rest of the year. So uh, the females from the South Shetlands leave the Antarctic over winter. And uh, as you can see with some data that was collected by AMLAR and analyzed by Arthur et al, uh, that they forage over winter either off the coast of South America or near South Georgia. Um, so perhaps it's foraging conditions there that are uh, causing negative outcomes for the population. We can't measure uh, foraging trip lengths because it has no meaning during that part of the year. So we looked at the arrival condition of females when they returned back to the colony the following year. And what we found was that the body condition of these females over time has actually increased, indicating that the overwinter foraging habitat quality is actually getting better over time. We were a little bit worried and we wanted to parse out, perhaps there's some effect here. If a lot of these females are losing their pups the year before, they might be fatter because they didn't have to raise a pup. So we looked at the data again, only looking at primaparous females. Uh, and we discovered in fact, that there's still a positive trend. So at the very least overwinter foraging habitat quality is not getting worse. It may even be getting better over time. So these negative drivers, uh, bottom up drivers, 
are actually concentrated spatially likely within the Northern Antarctic Peninsula. Oh, uh, sorry, both of those uh, were significant. So in conclusion, South Shetland fur seals are a genetically distinct and genetically diverse subpopulation, one that is rapidly crashing and in danger of extinction. The drivers for this are likely coming from both the top down and bottom up. And the loss of these animals would represent a substantial loss of genetic diversity for the entire species, decreasing its ability to respond to perturbations as the climate changes around us. So protections may need to be put in place to meet management objectives. Finally, I'd just like to thank all of these people, uh, especially our Chilean colleagues who have helped gather so much of this data over the years uh, and the rest of these fine people. That was great. Thank you so much, Doug. Uh, we do have time for probably one question. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Doug? You can either raise your hand or you can type it into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. I don't see any just yet, so I actually have a question. Um, I am wondering, is the reason the leopard seals coming in, is it because of a loss of sea ice? And so they're coming in closer to shore and kind of prey switching, or can you kind of describe that a little bit? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, that, that is absolutely our working hypothesis. So what we know is that there is a prey switch uh, for these leopard seals. Likely what they were uh, eating historically during this time of year, which is of, of particular energetic importance for those large females, because they've let, likely just reared a pup, um, were crab eater seal pups. So, so the, if you look at the studies from the 70s and the 80s and the early 90s, that's what they were eating. And because the ice has retreated in that area, and we just don't see crabbers anymore, uh, some of these leopard seals prey switched, and that's, that's likely what's going on. Uh, very interesting. Thank you so much. Um, and we are just out of time. I'll just note that there seems to be two questions kind of at the bottom there. So you're able to um, just chat away and answer those if you'd like. Um, otherwise, awesome. we can come back to it at the end as well. So thanks again so much, Doug. Um, Thank you. And now I will hand over the mic to Claire. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Awesome. Um, all right, let me just share my screen. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Claire Flynn, and today I'll be presenting my work, Adelie Penguins North and East of the Adelie Gap Continue to Thrive While Gen 2 Penguins Expand, that I did alongside co-authors Michael Wethington, Alex Borowitz, and P.I. Heather Lynch at Stony Brook University in New York. So the Adelie Gap is a 400 kilometer stretch on the Western Antarctic Peninsula that is completely absent of breeding Adelie Penguins. Uh, Gen 2 penguin colonies are also sparse in the zone, particularly in the northern part of the zone. However, chinstrap penguin colonies are abundant. Um, this is hypothesized to break the Adelie penguins on the Antarctic Peninsula up into different populations. Uh, the southern more reliant on the icy Bellingshausen Sea and the northern on the Weddell Sea. Uh, so the south of Gap Antarctic Peninsula, which, let me get my laser pointer. All right, the south of Gap region of the Antarctic Peninsula um, is very well studied. Um, lots of bases, research occurs here, um, and tourists visit often. And then up in the South Shetland Islands, which we just heard about the fur seals of, um, is also fairly well studied. All those um, bases that collect excellent research, lots of trips there. Um, and in both of these cases, the Adelie penguins are declining for the most part. Um, and Gen 2 penguins appear to be moving in. Um, however, this north of Gap Antarctic Peninsula region, which um, also goes into the tip of the Weddell Sea, is much less uh, well studied. There are fewer trips there because it is icier um, and fewer bases. So less is known about how this region is faring. A recent study um, did find a a uh, mega colony in the danger islands, right where this caution sign is of the Delhi penguins. Uh, there are three times as many as were expected to be in this region, over 750,000 breeding pairs. Um, 
while this region has not been well studied in the past, so it is not clear if um, this has historically always been around the same population, um, a historic uh, census of Harawina Island was very similar to the count that they got in this 2018 paper, um, indicating that perhaps this region is remaining stable. Um, so our question um, that we based this paper on was, are the danger islands special in their ability to um, house so many Adelie penguins, um, or are they indicative of a broader pattern of Adelie stability in this north of Gap Peninsula region? So we took a trip to this region. Uh, we were aboard the Greenpeace International ship, the Arctic Sunrise, and went to the sites that you can see on the right side of the screen. Um, so uh, up by Derville, we went to Wide Open, Medley Rocks, this region around here. Um, and then we went south of Joinville, um, visited these islands and sites here. And then we traveled down a little bit more into the Weddell Sea. Um, and the farthest south colony was Penguin Point. Uh, none of these colonies that we surveyed had published census counts from within the past 10 years. So all were um, relatively unknown what is occurring in these areas. Um, on the bottom left, you can see a picture of Alex Borowitz, the lead scientist on this expedition, um, conducting a census count of Adelie penguins on Devil Island. Uh, because of the pandemic, we arrived a little later in the season. So most of the chicks had crushed at this point, so we conducted chick censuses at every site that we went to for all species. And then in the bottom middle, you can see that we also conducted drone surveys. Um, when possible, we, could, we conducted these in tandem with ground census counts. However, sometimes there were time restraints, so it was faster to just do a drone survey. Or in the case of this island in the background, Cockburn Island, uh, the slope was very steep and unsafe to land, so we just conducted a drone survey from the Zodiac. The drone images returned ortho mosaics like this on the right. This was from Devil Island, uh, which we did a hand census count of and a drone census count. Um, all of the images stitched together to form this lovely ortho mosaic, which when you then zoom in, you can see the individual penguins. Um, so these are all Adelie penguins. Uh, however, they are a mixture of chicks and adults, which did make it difficult. So a tip both to ourselves and anyone else who might be doing this work is that drone imagery is um, much easier to analyze earlier in the season during incubation. So you can count nests instead of needing to differentiate between adults and chicks. However, there were some clear images such as this where we were able to differentiate between adults and chicks for the most part. Um, so adults are in red, chicks are in yellow. And we then counted individuals over the entire site and applied the ratio that we used in the clearer area to estimate the number of chicks on the whole site. Um, and because we did a hand census count and drone images in the same day, we were able to compare them and they were within 15% of each other. So onto the results on Devil Island, which you can see here into the Weddell Sea. Um, this is one of the most well-surveyed sites in this region. Um, and we counted almost 12,000 chicks. And to analyze this, we estimated the number of breeding pairs that this would represent um, by doing simulations, uh, by dividing the number of chicks by the expected reproductive success from this region. Um, we then did a weighted linear regression across the survey history from 1996 to 2021. Um, and found that there was a significant increasing trend over this period of 7.7% per year. Um, we did the natural log in order to represent the non-negative nature of census counts so that the um, predictions and confidence intervals would not be negative. All right, using the same method, um, we also analyzed um, Eden Rocks, which is up here, and Tayhead, also up near there, and Vortex Island, which is down into the Weddell Sea, closer to James Ross. Uh, these all had prior surveys, um, and analysis showed that there was no significant trend over their survey history. All right, the only colony that we did find a significant decline in was Penguin Point, which is out here on Seymour Island in the Weddell Sea. 
uh, we counted 21,561 chicks, and this showed a decreasing trend of 1.2% per year. However, our estimate of the number of breeding pairs for this year in 2021 was higher than the previous estimate in 2009, or the previous count in 2009, um, indicating that perhaps the decline has somewhat stabilized over recent years. We also conducted the first ground surveys of Medley Rocks and north of Medley Rocks up here and Cockburn Island, which is here. That is where the um, picture of the drone being launched from the Zodiac was. Uh, this is the first ever ground surveys for these sites. They were previously identified as penguin colonies from the guano stains visible on satellite imagery, but the species and the exact counts were unknown. So it was exciting to be able to get there. And we also um, documented ad breeding Adelie penguins for the first time on a little island we called north of Durville. And we counted 1,253 Adelie chicks on this site. So overall, um, these trends seem to be um, implying that this region is not seeing the same level of declines in Adelie penguins that the rest of the peninsula region is. All right, we also did Gen 2 penguin censuses. So we visited Medley Rocks and north of Medley Rocks, which were shared colonies with the Delis, um, and conducted the first ground surveys there. Uh, we documented Gen 2 penguins on the north of Durville Islands and also on Cape Scrimger, which was particularly exciting because this is at the southernmost end of the Gen 2 penguins range on the side of the Weddell Sea. Um, so it was exciting to be able to see them this far south. We also were unable to conduct a full census, but we did um, land on wide open islands up here. And we noted that there were breeding Gen 2 penguins at the site where in the past only Adelie and Chumstrap penguins had been noted to be breeding there. So these results seem to imply that Gen 2 penguins may be moving into this area, in particular Cape Scrimger with only 75 chicks could have been founded in the past 10 or five to 10 years. Um, so, because um, these trends are not often seen together, Adelie penguins being stable and Gen 2 penguins moving in, uh, we began investigating what makes this region special, why it is able to support both of these species. So, we looked into the sea ice concentration in the region. Um, sea ice concentration is the percentage of um, surface, ocean surface that is covered in sea ice. Um, so we used sea ice concentration data from 1979 to 2021 that was processed by the NASA team algorithm and acquired by the US National Snow and Ice Data Center. And we divided it into those three regions that I had on the map earlier in the slideshow, the North of Gap region, the South Shetland Islands, and the South of Gap Antarctic Peninsula region. And we found that overall from 1979 to 2021, all three regions showed significant decline in sea ice concentration. Um, the south of Gap Antarctic Peninsula region did show much more um, decline in sea ice concentration. We then um, took this a step farther and broke up the sea ice concentration trends into quarters of the year. So we analyzed them in January through March for each region and April through June, etc. And we did find that in every single quarter, in every single region, there were significant declines, except for the first quarter. In that January to March quarter, um, things got a little interesting. In the North of Gap region, um, there's actually a significant increase in the amount of sea ice concentration from 1979 to 2001. On the South Shetland Islands, um, there was no significant change. And in the South of Gap region, there was a significant decline. So what does all of this mean for the Pygocelles penguins? Our question that we wanted to answer is, are the danger islands special or are they indicative of a broader pattern of Adelie stability in the north of Gap Peninsula region? So we found that the Adelie populations in the north of Gap region do not seem to be declining to the same extent in, um, as they are in the rest of the peninsula. They appear to be relatively stable. Um, surprisingly, even as these populations are holding steady, the Gen 2 penguin populations have increased and are moving in in geographic extent. Often those are thought to be mutually exclusive events where Adelis are seen as climate losers and Gen 2s as climate winners. 
Um, but this appears to be somewhat of, um, let's say, a Goldilocks zone where both um, have been able to live. Um, so a potential explanation for this is that Adelian Gen 2 penguins may be sensitive to sea ice conditions at different times of the year. Um, perhaps the decreasing, um, the decreasing winter sea ice seen in this region has allowed the Gen 2 penguins to move in, where the um, stable uh, summer, January to March sea ice, um, has been able to sustain Adelie populations. All right, and I know I've reached um, almost the 13 minute mark, so I'll quickly go through this. Um, most of this region is included in the proposed MPA. Um, so our timely surveys um, highlight that this is a, a unique eco region, um, and we hope that this survey can play a role in informing decisions made about this MPI. All right, I'm happy to answer any questions. I know I didn't leave as much time, so feel free to reach out to me at this email that I've listed. Great, thank you, Claire. No, you've actually left uh, plenty of time. We've got uh, two minutes for questions. So does anyone have questions for Claire? Um, again, you can use the, uh, the chat function, the Q&A function, or the raise hand function. So I do have one question. I'm just kind of trying to monitor at the same time. So forgive me if I'm uh, interrupting someone's question, but um, so I've never been to this particular area. What is the landscape of uninhabited, like ice-free areas? Um, so particularly, I'm curious about the Cape, um, was it Cape Sc Scrimger? Um, yeah. Was that completely uninhabited before and now the Gen 2s are coming in? Or can you tell us a little bit more about what that looks like? Yeah, well, um, it's unknown. There's no record of penguins being there in the past. Um, and we've looked at the satellite imagery to see if perhaps it was covered by ice before, um, but it is unclear. Uh, just anecdotally, it did seem that the nests were less well established. Um, there was less detritus that seemed to accumulate from year to year. Uh, so we did seem to think that this could be a new colony. And another woman in our lab, Rachel Herman, is an expert on Gen 2 penguins colonizing new islands. And she has suggested that this could be could have been done in five to 10 years. That's incredible. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, we have only about 15 seconds left, so I might suggest that uh, we can move on to the next speaker. But if you have any questions for Claire, please feel free uh, to, again, put them in the Q&A. Um, and then again, if you, anything comes up between now and the end, we can definitely come back to it. Um, in the last 10 to 15 minutes of the session. Thanks so much, Claire. Thank you. Um, wonderful. And our next speaker is Sarah. So over to you, Sarah. Thank you. Let me just go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Okay, um, can everyone see my screen okay? Looks great. Okay, great. So thanks everyone for joining. Um, today I'm gonna to be sharing information and preliminary results um, from a project titled, Identifying a Network of Key Biodiversity Areas for the Southern Ocean Using Animal Tracking Data. And I'm leading analysis on this work under the guidance of my PhD advisor and project PI, Dr. Cassandra Brooks. And with support from the co-authors listed here among other collaborators and funded by the Antarctic and Southern Ocean Coalition via Blue Nature Alliance. So I'll start with a brief overview of the history and approach of the key biodiversity areas framework. The goals of the KBA approach are summarized well by this quote from their website, which reads, um, by providing the precise location of places that contribute significantly to the global persistence of biodiversity, KBAs can accelerate efforts to reverse the loss of nature by ensuring conservation efforts are focused in the places that matter most and by enabling entities that may have negative impacts on nature to avoid or reduce those impacts in the places they'd be the most damaging. So development of the KBA process began at the World Conservation Congress in Bangkok in 2004, where IUC members there recognized the need for a unifying framework for identifying important sites across all biodiversity. 
And this document uh, titled the Global Standard for the Identification of Key Biodiversity Areas was developed to fill this need. And um, it was formally adopted by the IUCN Council and launched at the World Conservation Congress in Hawaii in 2016. And in addition to this document, um, a key partnership was formed at that time as well with 13 concert leading conservation organizations um, now committed to identifying, mapping, and monitoring and conserving sites around the world according to this KBA process. So the KBA standard includes criteria that are designed to capture biodiversity at the species, ecosystem, and genetic levels. And collectively, these aim to capture the various ways in which a site could be important for the global persistence of biodiversity, either because it holds threatened or geographically restricted biodiversity, has outstanding ecological integrity, maintains biological processes, or is shown to be highly irreplaceable through quantitative analysis. And there are 11 criteria in total grouped into these five broad categories, A through E listed above. And for our project, we're focusing on species specific criteria under A, B, and D, and specifically A1, which focuses on species with a global risk of extinction, B1, which focuses on species with a limited geographic range, and D1, which focuses on biological processes that are geographically restricted. So this one aims to preserve sites that hold a significant portion of the global population of a specific species, while that species is aggregated for a life history process such as feeding, breeding, or migration um, during a specific demographic phase. So the data set we use uh, is the retrospective analysis of Antarctic tracking data, um, which I'm sure many people here are familiar with. Um, this was compiled and made publicly available in 2020 with the paper shown here. So RAPID, um, as I'll refer to it from now on, um, is a SCAR project that's led jointly by the expert groups on birds and marine mammals and the Antarctic biodiversity informatics. And it includes tracking data from 17 predator species, 4,060 animals, and more than 2.9 million observed locations. And the taxonomic spatial and temporal coverage within the data set isn't uniform, um, as it was originally derived by compiling data shared by many different contributors, which were originally collected for a range of different studies. Uh, but the Coverage, however, is well documented. And here we can see the overall spatial as well as species level temporal coverage of the data set shown here um, and these figures drawn from the 2020 paper, uh, as well as all the species that are included in the data set and associated sample sizes. And I'll note here that for our analysis, we're just using a portion of the RADA data that was most appropriate for use with our tools. Um, and this included the PTT and GPS tag data but excluded GLS tags uh, just due to the large location errors that these tags can have and issues that this would cause with our specific analyses. And there are several versions of the data that are publicly available. Um, rather than using raw tracks, we're using state-space model outputs that were used in the Hindle et al. 2020 paper. And these extrapolate evenly spaced intermediate points between raw detection data. So for our analysis, um, we linked heavily on this R package called Track 2 KBA, which was introduced and described here in this BL et al. 2021 paper. And it's a custom R package designed for using tracking data to identify KBAs. And essentially how this works is the tool takes raw tracking data, and then it applies a sort of standardized, anal standardized analysis um, in order to sort of delineate locally important site boundaries and also to generate population estimates for the number of mature individuals using potential sites. So before those tools can be applied, um, data has to first be partitioned into um, data groups. And these groups indicate unique periods of movement for a source population. Um, and we define them here by subdividing the data set by species, tagging location or colony, and seasonal stages appropriate to the species, so breeding, molting, or migration. And this led to 217 data groups from our portion of the RADA data. And we then looked at for groups with a sample size that were greater with an N of greater than or equal to 10. And this left 63 data groups distributed between 16 species for further analysis. And um, in addition to the tracking data, this analysis requires several input values on species life history and population. And so we used a targeted literature review and 
um, expert opinion to generate best estimates for values defining movement and foraging ecology for each of these groups, as well as population estimates at the tagging location, as well as the global, at the global scale. And in many cases, this is also helping us identify um, where data gaps exist for these different groups. And this information is used um, to determine, the movement data is used to determine whether a data group is engaging in central place foraging. Um, and if so, we um, do some additional data filtering in order to subdivide the track into individual foraging trips. And that's in order to avoid biasing the final site estimates um, towards the colony or central site. And then the population data um, is used to estimate local abundance and compare um, to later compare this against KBA criteria thresholds. So this schematic here drawn from Beale et al. Um, gives an overview of the steps of the analysis done for each of the 16 species and 63 data groups that we're looking at. So we'll track one specific data group um, as an example of this workflow. So we'll look at king, king penguins at Spit Bay on Heard Island during the incubation phase. And so the first step of this analysis involves choosing an appropriate smoothing parameter for each data group. And as shown by this figure from Beale et al, too small leads to under smoothing the tracks and un sort of uncharacteristically small site estimates, while over smoothing um, will lead to site overestimates. So the choice of smoothing parameter is really important. Uh, the track 2 KBA package does provide some built in functionality to analyze tracks in order to guide selection of these parameters. And so once these smoothing values are determined, uh, the next step is to estimate kernel density estimate contours for each individual animal. And KDEs essentially take the density of points within a track and draw a polygon around whatever portion of the data is designated as the appropriate contour interval. And we use 50% contours for all of our analyses as it's a commonly used cutoff uh, to determine core use areas. And we can then assess those, the overlap in those individual KDEs to look at the representativeness um, of these core areas or to get an estimate of the representativeness of these core areas to the underlying population. And this is by using some iterative resampling methods to see how well training subsets of these groups predict uh, test subsets. And so finally, uh, the density of the overall study population use within a region um, is mapped by synthesizing these individual core area overlaps. And then site boundaries shown in red here um, are determined by kind of highlighting this area of highest density of, of uh, core area overlap um, and with the proportion of the area scaled to the representativeness score. So highly representative areas will select a slightly larger area while less representative sites um, will choose a slightly more conservative region um, with only the greatest similarity between individuals. And groups with less than 70% representativeness um, are deemed too unrepresentative to continue moving forward in the analysis. And so then sites are scaled by local population estimates to generate an estimated number of mature individuals using the site. So the next step then is to determine which criteria are appropriate to assess this site against. So for our Spit Bay King Penguins, we first looked at threat status and the least concern designation for this species rules out using criteria A1. We then ask, is it a geographically res restricted species? And if so, um, oh, and since it is not, we cannot consider it for B1. And lastly, for D1, um, we determine whether the site is predictably used during a specific demographic phase. And for these, we say they are, as it's a foraging area used during the incubation phase of the breeding season. And so we can proceed for now with assessing against criteria D1. So again, in order to assess, we need those numbers of mature individuals using the site um, estimated by Track 2 KBA, as well as the estimate of global populations. And we use those global population numbers to generate population thresholds in accordance with um, the criteria guidelines and then compare those to the estimated site abundance. And other criteria hold different or additional thresholds and all of this is found in that KBA global standard document. Um, so in the end, our Spit Bay, Heard Island king penguins did not trigger a KBA. However, the other king penguin group that we assessed um, did trigger one in the waters near Macquarie Island, south of New Zealand. 
And to zoom out um, from this one data group that we've been tracking, to, um, this figure shows all of the sites um, currently mapped in these preliminary results as triggering KBAs mapped by species and in relation to existing management zones and spatial biodiversity designations. So of our total data set, 29 KBAs have been identified for further review out of the 63 total data groups we assessed. And that includes five out of five penguin species, three out of seven of the flying seabirds, and five out of the five marine mammals that we assessed. So moving forward to go from these species level results to final site recommendations, um, We'll look further at existing designations in the area, such as important bird areas, important marine mammal areas, ecologically and biologically significant areas, as well as existing KBAs. And we'll need to consider all of that um, for final delineation with consider of how to handle overlap in these designations. And additionally, consideration of jurisdiction and management zone um, will need to be taken into account. KBAs are intended to be realistically manageable units. So sites crossing CAMLAR boundaries or EEZs might require subdividing before final submission to the KBA database. Two minutes. So, there. okay, sounds good, thank you. Um, so we'll be hosting a workshop next week affiliated with this conference, which is scheduled for August 8th and 10th. And that's designed both to provide additional information on our work to the community at large, and also to solicit feedback on the methods and especially on the species life history and population inputs that we're using um, so that we can update those um, and incorporate kind of the broad scope of knowledge in this community on these species into our final analysis and site recommendations moving forward. So anyone here today or anyone else you think might be interested is welcome to attend. Um, registration for this conference gains you access to that just in the same way via the Live Now portal. And um, I will note both sessions are identical, just at different time zones um, to accommodate, um, yeah, for convenience of participants. And then following the workshop, we'll continue to solicit feedback for several weeks, um, and we'll then incorporate this input and feedback into final analyses and site delineation before submitting a workshop report to the 2022 CAMLAR annual meeting, and sometime thereafter, a formal proposal to the KBA Secretariat so I'm probably right at, at about time now, but thanks for your time and happy to take questions now if time allows or chat further via email or at the workshops. Thanks. We do have time. We have time for probably one question. We've got about one minute left. Um, so I'm gonna just check the Q&A here um, and see if anybody has questions. Does anyone wanna write a question or raise their hand? And apologies if I've been missing people raising their hands. I'm, I hope I'm checking the right spots to do that. Any questions for Sarah? Okay, well, I do have one. Um, so one of the questions I was kind of curious about was about the idea of geographically restricted areas. It seems kind of qualitative. And so can you tell us a little bit more about how kind of how that's defined by the IUCN and how like how relative is that to the species versus the ecosystem, the population, that kind of a thing? Yeah, um, I will need to would need to pull up the global standard to give you to give you a more a, a more full answer. But all of the um, all the criteria do have um, fairly um, specifically defined quantitative threshold. So I think, oh gosh, I don't, I'd have to look at it to fully answer. Um, that's okay. No worries. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's okay. I was just, that just seems like your, your study was incredibly uh, in depth and a lot of, a lot of information there. So yeah, I was just curious yeah. about it. It's we were only potentially taken. considering royal penguins was the only species we were potentially considering for that one. And that's something that we'll be hoping to get feedback on at the workshop as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much. All right. Um, thank you. All right. Wonderful. Uh, thank you for your, for your time and the presentation. And our next presentation is by Malia, and she has sent in a video. So IT, if you could please play her video, that would be great. And then we'll take uh, questions for her. Um, if anyone has any afterwards, um, we can write them down and hopefully get them to her if she hasn't shown up. Thanks.
Hi, IT. I'm not sure if it's just me, but I, I'm not able to hear her. I'm not sure if anyone else can hear. Yeah, I can't hear either. Sorry, IT, I'm not sure if you guys can hear us, but we can't hear the presentation. So I don't know if you guys are able to fix that, but if you can, that'd be great. Thanks. Yes, I can't uh, hear either, Michelle. Sorry, everybody, we're trying to work through this. Hang tight. Just an apology team. Um, I haven't gotten any feedback from the IT folks. I'm hoping they're working on it. Sorry about this.
our IT host, um, I've been asking you to un please unmute yourself. If you could do that, that'd be great. Hi everyone, thank you for coming to my talk today titled Antarctic Blue and Fin Whale Baleen Isotopes Reveal Insights on Ecology and Life History. This presentation covers some of the work I'm currently doing for my PhD. Unfortunately, I am in the mountains of Canada and cannot present this talk live, but please reach out to me by email and I will respond once I'm back in North Carolina. Blue whales are the largest mammals on earth and fin whales are the second largest. Even though these two species occupy the Southern Ocean, they have different prey preferences. Blue whales specialize on krill, while fin whales are more generalist and will eat whatever is present when they open their mouths, which can be fish, copepods, or squid, in addition to larger body krill than typically eaten by blue whales. Many blue and fin whales were killed from the early 1900s to about 1970 from whaling. The blue whale stock, which you can see in the top graph in blue, plummeted from about 200,000 to about 3,000. Similarly, for the fin whales shown in the bottom graph in red, their stock dropped from about 400,000 whales to 15,000 whales. Overall, over 2 million whales from several species were killed during this time period in the Southern Ocean. At the end of World War II, the US had won several battles with Japan including the bombing of Hiroshima, which led to their surrender shortly after. And these Japanese citizens were suffering from lack of food and resources after years of war and battles. So General Douglas MacArthur, who commanded the Southwest Pacific during World War II, authorized Japan to start whaling in the Southern Ocean to keep them as an ally instead of an enemy. Dr. Remington Kellogg was the mammal curator for the Smithsonian at the time and recommended to General MacArthur that the Japanese whalers send a couple of baleen plates from each whale to the Smithsonian, and the whalers agreed. You can see an example of one of the baleen plates here. Diet studies will typically use carbon and nitrogen isotopes of a specific tissue. In my case, I use baleen powder. The delta C13 values are used to look at the geographic location of a sample based on the prey consumed and changes in sea surface temperature. The delta N15 values are typically used as a marker for trophic level. When using baleen plates, baleen plates they can range in length 
depending on the species. So for blue and fin whales, they can be about 60 to 90 centimeters. The information covered in that range has been previously shown to equate to about three to five years of life history data. Because these whales are migratory, we can see these oscillations in their isotope values like this figure here, demonstrating how carbon valleys in black are summer feeding grounds and carbon peaks are winter feeding grounds, likely showing the migration between high and low latitudes. These trends in latitude are often used in creating isoscapes, which are isotopic spatial maps. The figures on the side here are showing carbon in the top and nitrogen in the bottom. These isoscapes were based on particulate organic matter from several cruises taking samples at multiple depths and different times of the year. We can see here for carbon in the top that the trend is that values are decreasing with increasing latitude. And again, this is driven by the sea surface temperature. While the nitrogen in the bottom is showing less of a latitudinal trend, and more of a trend between open water versus coastal areas. Overall, it's important to have and understand these isoscapes to help understand why we might see oscillations in baleen data. The hypotheses I'm trying to address with this preliminary data are that there will be evidence of niche partitioning between blue and fin whales based on their known differences in prey preferences. There will be differences in their life history strategies, Blue whales will remain in the Southern Ocean year round, while fin whales do not, which is something previously suggested by acoustic data. And finally, that isotopic oscillations will remain cyclical and consistent for each individual's annual cycle. I used baleen plates from five blue whales and five fin whales. The blue whales are shown in blue and the fin whales are shown in black. Baleen plates were sampled at the Smithsonian Archives with a Dremel, starting near the cut of the plate at the proximal end, penetrating only the cortex layer along the buccal edge. This image here is one of the fin whale plates we used, and you can see the sampling locations from the Dremel. About three milligrams of powder was collected and then stored until further analysis. The stored powder was then analyzed at the Center for Marine Science, um, at UNCW for carbon and nitrogen values. I did not correct the carbon for anthropogenic effects from the Industrial Revolution, also known as the Seuss effect, because the change of carbon values for the Southern Ocean is negligible. The isoscapes I used to help interpret my data was from a, two, a 2019 paper by Espinas et al. I used values from the Ross Sea because this is where my individuals were captured, shown in the dark blue box. The pink arrow is highlighting the subantarctic front, which I use to separate migration within the Southern Ocean. In previous papers, I was expecting that the carbon valleys would be representative of the Southern Ocean and potential feeding grounds while the peaks would be breeding grounds at the subantarctic front or even more north. I started with a Kruskal Wallace rank sun test to test for differences in delta C13 and delta N15 values between species. Specifically, I wanted to compare peaks and valleys, with the peaks and valleys being defined as the highest and lowest two to three values in each oscillation. Next, I wanted to calculate the inverse coefficient of variance to assess stability or consistency among plates and between species. Following previous baleen time series papers, I use a Gaussian low pass filter to focus on seasonal trends of the data with a fast Fourier transform. And these analyses were specifically to help calculate the baleen growth rates. Unfortunately, there wasn't a big enough sample size to test for any sex differences. On the graph here, we have carbon on the X and nitrogen on the Y. The blue whales are shown in blue and the fin whales are in black and gray. I have the averages of all the blue and all the fin whales highlighted in these two red boxes. Using the Kruskal Wallace test, there were significant differences in the carbon values, but not the nitrogen values. This suggests that there could be some niche partitioning or feeding in different latitudes, but likely still the same trophic level. My second hypothesis was addressing if my isotope data supported previous acoustic data, suggesting that blue whales remain in the Southern Ocean year round. Based on the isoscapes I showed you all earlier, 
I included the raw values from the raw sea area, shown as the, the dark blue square, and then the subantarctic front, which is the highlighted orange, potential seasonal variation when in gray, and the southern ocean as shown in blue. The top figure is of a blue whale, and the bottom figure is a fin whale. The x-axis is sampling along the plate with older growth on the left and newer growth on the right. The y-axis is the carbon isotope values. And then from this, we can see the migration patterns between these species are very different. The blue whale in the top appears to stay closer to Antarctica year round, while the fin whale in the bottom may migrate more north seasonally. For my third hypothesis, I was predicting to see differences in the life history strategies between the species. I also found a significant difference between the peaks and valleys. This suggests again that blue whales do have different migrations and life history strategies, so when and where these two species are going to their feeding and breeding grounds are likely different. My last hypothesis was focused on if these isotopic oscillations would remain cyclical and consistent for each individual. This would suggest a highly annual migration pattern or potential breeding and feeding site fidelities. I started by testing the stability of the oscillations by calculating the inverse coefficient of variation. This was done by dividing the mean nitrogen value of each plate by the standard deviation. The higher the values, the more stable or consistent the cycles were. So this example is of two blue whales. These two figures have sampling on the x-axis and nitrogen values on the y. BM05 is on the left and has the highest stability value shown above the plot, while BM03 had the lowest stability value, and the difference between them was 243%. When looking at this on a species level, the fin whales were overall 40% more stable than the blue whales for nitrogen. And I'm only showing nitrogen because it's the isotope I used to calculate the growth rates, which is based off of previous papers suggesting that nitrogen cycles are consistently cyclical in baleen whales. Still with hypothesis four, I calculated the growth rates, again with just the nitrogen values. The data was passed through a Gaussian low pass filter, which is just used to help smooth the data to visualize the seasonal trends, which is what we're interested in. You can see the difference in the data before and after the filter on the right graphs. Following the filter, I used a fast Fourier transform to calculate the frequencies and periods from the oscillations, which were used to calculate the growth rate. Only two blue whales and three fin whales actually had detectable cycles um, and were used in the growth rate calculations. The main preliminary conclusions from this data, starting with hypothesis one, that there would be evidence of niche partitioning, which my significant differences in carbon values between the species does suggest. The differences in foraging lo location may also be due to the generalist diet of fin whales or potential differences in physiology. For hypotheses two and three, the differences in life history strategies and if blue whales remain in the Southern Ocean year round, my results suggest that there are differences in life history strategies. Um, from the differences in carbon peaks and valleys, growth rates, and seasonal migrations. The, my preliminary results also support previous acoustic studies showing that blue whales likely stay in the Southern Ocean year round, while fin whales do not. Finally, my last hypothesis that isotopic oscillations remain cyclical and consistent for each year an individual was not supported by my preliminary results. I found that fin whales had 40% more stability in their isotopic oscillations than blue whales, and not all individuals even had detectable annual cycles. Finally, I just want to thank everyone involved in this project, from the funding, sample collection, and all the undergrads and grad students who have helped and are currently helping with analyses, my committee, friends, and professors. Thank you. Okay, I think it looks like we've got our technical glitches out of the way. Um, so since Malia won't be here um, to answer questions, I would of course encourage uh, anyone who has questions to email her directly. Um, and so we'll move on now to Sophia. So Sophia, if you're ready, if you could share your screen, that would be great.
All right, thank you, Michelle. And yes, also glad all the technical stuff is out of the way. So let's yeah, have a now. smooth so talk good. from here on. Yeah, good. <laughs> um, good day from Australia. It's already Wednesday here. Um, my name is Sophia Volsky, and I'm presenting my research on the differences in age dependent survival between male and female southern elephant seals. So just for some background, um, demographic research is the study of animal population dynamics. It requires the knowledge of the overall abundance of a population. The baseline of this is calculating the balance of these four major components of births, deaths, IMI and emigration, which can give estimates of population growth or decline over time. However, identifying the underlying demographic processes involves um, more detailed estimation of vital rates, such as survival, fecundity, and recruitment. In contrast to abundance data, um, which are pure counts of animals present in the population, vital rates are calculated from capture mark recapture data, which can identify and follow individual animals over time. Populations of southern elephant seals have been monitored since the middle of the 19th century. These animals exhibit strong side fidelity, which means individuals reliably return to their natal breeding grounds. And this enables tracking or tagging for reliable demographic studies. Breeding colonies are distributed on subantarctic islands that surround the Antarctic continent. And from there, seals go on long foraging migrations where they cover great distances of the Southern Ocean. Southern elephant seals are one of the most polygamous of all mammals with one dominant male, beach master, breeding with tens or hundreds of females in a harem. They also exhibit extreme sexual dimorphism as adults. One of the longest historic data sets of southern elephant seal resites exists for the Macquarie Island population. This population is the only major breeding population in the Pacific section of the Southern Ocean and makes up about 10% of the global abundance of the species. We consider Macquarie Island a closed population, so we do not account for the effects of immigration or emigration in our models. Um, while the animals foraging range may overlap, their preference to return to their natal breeding sites is resulting in clear genetic distinction between the four major populations. So any other green dots you see here on this map surrounding Macquarie Island, that those are haul out sites where the animals may come ashore during the breeding season to rest or molt, sorry, outside the breeding season to rest or molt. And um, at Macquarie Island, long-term demographic model modeling has documented a continuous low population decline since the 1960s. And this has prompted some interesting research into the species demography. We are aware of some key components that contribute to population growth or decline in this population. Previous research has mainly concentrated on solely analyzing females because males do not contribute to paternal care. Um, females solely raise, nurse and care for their pups while fasting on land for three weeks until the pups are weaned. And therefore females producing healthy, heavy and fat offspring was identified as a key factor in this species population dynamics. Um, for some components where males were considered in the analysis, the data only took into account a snapshot in the animal's life history. For example, first year and juvenile survival. Uh, for my PhD research, I am analyzing long-term climate influences on survival trends. And I raised the question of how male survival compares to female survival in this population. This is relevant when discussing long-term trends in the, and the potential for adaptation in this species. A successful beach master will contribute a disproportionate amount of genetic material to future generations. So we should consider including these males in the modeling effort um, when assessing a population's vulnerability to future change. An extensive capture mark recapture project collected individual resites of over 14,000 seals that were marked at birth. Organized searches then continuously recorded resites for years, even after active branding of newborn pups ceased. This animal in the top right is one encountered recently here in Australia, we, um, which this would have been one of the last ones marked in the 1999 cohort, making it a 23 year old female. As you can tell from this statement, having an individual mark that lasts for the entirety of the animal's lifetime 
enables us to calculate their age and therefore their survival rate easily. These individual survival rates are then summarized to give us estimates of overall survival at the population level. Notably, our models are able to account for variation in observer effort by also calculating the probability of detecting an animal if it survived. Demographic analysis requires testing the data for overdispersion, which was done by using goodness of fit tests in this case. Some inconsistencies with these are expected, however, because we are testing a modified Cormac Jolly SIBA model for differences in time or age dependent survival. Age is modeled as time since first capture, since these animals were all branded as pups. And lastly, intersex differences in these components were suspected to be important due to the extreme dimorphism and general behavioral differences of these animals when they are adults. Model selection was done by ranking the over dispersion adjusted AIC in R mark. Now let's get into some results. So model selection results and goodness of fit testing both indicated clear intersex differences that need to be accounted for by our model. The most parsimonious model that was selected let survival vary with sex and age and includes time dependent detection, meaning the year the data was collected influenced how many resites were able to be recorded. I will get into both of these results individually, but overall the main difference that jumps out at first is the effect of sex on both components of this model, with males having a higher chance of being encountered but consistency lower survival rates than females of all ages. Detectability varying over time is very common in demographic models. As much as organized searches are designed to be consistent, there's great variability in observer effort between years. We included data from active marking of pups from 1993 till 1999. And as you can see, detection estimates are quite high in the 60% range for the early time period. It is also increasing after a first dip off in the first year, um, as the animals that were first tagged get older and mature, larger, animal, larger males are easier to spot and there are fewer of them, resulting in higher detection probability for the few successful males that survive to adulthood. This is something to be addressed by our model as we take age or developmental stage into account for the survival component. Detection estimates then become more variable as active marking ceased. Monitoring continued after this point, but with a different effort, searching for seals mainly in the breeding season when there are a large number of them. And a clear drop off in the ability of our model to estimate detection is seen by the gray confidence intervals that go a little bit wild after 2010. This is likely driven by a low sample size of the very few individuals that survived to over 20 years old. Um, but it's still valuable to include them in our data set as we specifically are interested in the age effect. As for survival, these results showed similar trends and estimates for juvenile males and females, males being consistently about five to 10% lower than female survival. And we then note an abrupt decrease in male survival after about seven years of development. And at this age, the sexual dimorphism diverges quickly. Uh, males are biologically mature at about six or seven years old, which means they are capable of breeding. However, they will need to continue to grow to be socially competitive for dominant status in the social hierarchy. Generally, breeding bulls will be a minimum of nine years old and early demographic studies documented a mean of about 12 years of age for beach masters. So it really seems to be that time they approach social maturity that we see this distinct drop off in survival for males. But differences in adult energetic requirements may be the reason why adult males adapt their foraging strategy. Adult males are known to frequent productive shelf waters where they risk predation by orcas and sharks. And this is necessary in order to reach competitive breeding size. So this distinction in adult survival was likely a result of the species highly polygamous mating system with only few males managing to successfully grow and survive to socially mature, while females are more likely to survive to older ages. Each is a strategy to maximize the reproductive output an individual can produce in a lifetime. Male survival 
differs from female survival overall. However, juvenile survival trends seems to almost match up to age seven, and this may enable a joint analysis of juvenile survival, essentially doubling the data set available for more complex demographic estimation of phyto rates. My future research will address this by developing matrix population models. And um, I'm hoping to be able to analyze climate influences on both male and female survival with the help of these. Um, thank you very much. And um, I am open to any questions and discussions. Great presentation, Sophia, thank you. Um, does anyone have questions? Checking, checking. Again, you can either raise your hand or put it in the chat or put it in the Q&A function. We got plenty of time for questions. All right, I don't see any, so I'll kick, I'll kick it off myself. Um, so one of the questions that I have for you, Sophia, is in that marked difference or marked drop off at seven years, what is the difference in causes of mortality for, for juveniles versus after they're seven years old? So the main difference would be what we've seen in the males um, going to productive shelf waters mainly. So uh, males and females are covering similar areas, but the males are more likely to frequent those highly productive um, continental shelf waters. And because they're highly productive, there will be predators there. The juveniles, there generally is no difference between male and female foraging for juveniles, but they do stay a little bit more local around Macquarie Island, or they return more frequently to the island. So that's a little bit um, of the difference there. So they kind of stay close when they're young and then forage out a little farther and get a little bit more dangerous. To a point, yes, they can go out, but they will always return for a mid-year haul out as well. So there is some very sort of subtle differences in the behavior, whereas the males, when they're adults, will stay out for quite a long time on these shelf waters. And I guess there's a lot of pressure for them to grow very big and competitive. So they need to stay out there longer. That makes sense. Thank you. Um, and in the Q&A we have uh, from Angus, are there any major climatic events during your data set that you'll be looking at? Yes, so I have already looked at uh, broad scale climate, so the Southern Annular Mode and the Southern Oscillation Index, and um, that has given me some indication that sea ice cover might be um, one thing that I need to be looking at specifically um, in the foraging range of these males and females, um, because there is probably a component there that is influenced by climate where the seals might not be able to access um, foraging grounds if the sea ice is locking them out of areas in a very specific time of year. So that's one of the things I want to be investigating. What are the predators, David? Um, uh, mainly killer whales, uh, so or orcas, I have to be uh, scientific about it, and um, sleeper sharks. Great, any other questions? Looking to see if anyone has their hand raised. Wonderful. I think uh, I think that'll conclude this. Thank you so much for the presentation, Sophia. Thank you. Great. And now we move on to Dean. Take it away, Dean. Hello, I'm I'm Dean Anderson from Manaki Fenua Land Care Research in New Zealand. And I'm going to be talking about uh, overwinter migration or movement of a daily penguins in the in the Ross Sea. Um, in 2017, uh, the Ross Sea was designated as a marine protected area, shown by these black lines here, the different zones of the marine protected area. 
And associated with that is research and monitoring to assess the progress or evolution of the ecosystem and to inform management decisions about the marine protected area. And we're doing research on a daily penguins as sentinels of the larger ecosystem because changes in behavior or population dynamics may indicate larger changes in the raw sea due to prey abundance or distribution, which could be related to fisheries management, or ice abundance and distribution, which could be related to, well, which would be related to climate change. And it's really important that we understand these relationships so that if we do start to see changes in behavior or populations, we can attribute those changes to either fisheries management or climate change to make um, appropriate decisions moving forward. So if we look at um, the western side of the Ross Sea going up the Victoria Land coastline from Ross Island down here in the south um, to Cape Adair up in the north, this is a very rough approximation of the breeding, or not breeding area, sort of foraging area of breeding adults during the summer, which is quite a limited area. Over the, the winter, however, um, the Adelie penguins are using the entirety of the Ross Sea and more, and all of the marine protected area. These are location data from 53 birds taken from uh, Cape Berta on Ross Island. Again, Ross Island's right down here, and Cape Adair up here. And the blue is uh, Cape Adair, and the, the red is um, Cape, Cape Bird. And the, the overwinter movement or migration period takes up about seven to eight months of the year. And what happens during this period uh, really has a big impact on the survival of the birds, as well as their ability to prepare um, for the subsequent breeding season. And during this time, they need access to food. Uh, so they need high food um, abundance to be able to forage efficiently and they need access to the water so we can't have or they can't have solid ice cover they need gaps in the ice to be able to access the water um, but they don't want or they can't have complete open water either they need access to ice and they need daylight to be able to see to to forage so we deployed geolocators on the ankles of um, penguins from Cape Bird and Cape Adair. And these measure light levels and they give us, we can estimate when sunset is and when sunrise is. And from that, we can get approximate location data over the, the overwinter movement period. So we then developed a hidden Markov movement model to try to uh, examine these data to find out how these um, utilization distribution patterns emerge from a mechanistic movement model. And you can see the 95% utilization distribution isopleth around this utilization distribution here, where the dark spots are showing high use areas um, and the low area, low, the light spots are less less used. And in the, the model, we basically try to um, interrogate the environmental factors that influence velocity and direction of movement, and the factors that influence the influence residency behavior. And the second one is really the important one, and on, and on which we make inference for the um, ecology of the system. These residency periods are where and when the birds slow down and spend extended periods of time in localized areas, as shown in these, these red circles here. So they've got pretty rapid movement and then they stay here for several, several weeks probably, or yeah, and then, and then move on. What influences those residency periods? And this is really important um, because over this overwinter movement, period, they have to fatten up and they have to gain strength to prepare them for the return trip back to the breeding colony and for uh, a successful breeding season. When they return to the colony, 
they have to establish and defend a nest, which is can result in a lot of fighting and, and injuries. The females have to produce and lay two large eggs, which is um, metabolically um, demanding. And after the eggs are laid, the, the males sit on or incubate the, the eggs for four to five to six weeks. And then once the, the um, eggs hatch, the males and females exchange provisioning the chicks. So it's a, it's a metabolically demanding season that they have to fatten up and gain strength for. So the factors we look at in our model are uh, sea ice concentration, we're looking at bathymetry or seafloor topography, um, and which is we're using as a, a proxy for ecosystem productivity, considered daylight, and then sea currents. So if we look at some results graphically using images here, we can sea currents jumps out of the model as being quite important. And that's because even though a bird may want to go in a particular direction and velocity, the sea currents will influence that, that movement, giving rise to the observed movement data that we, that we see. Now, bathymetry or um, seafloor topography turns out to be important as illustrated by this bird. This is one, the path of one single bird from Cape Adare. Okay, so here's Cape Adare. The bird came out here, started in this special research zone of the MPA, followed the, this is the continental shelf and the slope. And so it, it follows the, the slope margin up this Iceland bank over to the Bellini Islands, back onto the shelf and around to the Bellini Islands before it would have to return to Cape Adair. So you can see it's, you know, it's really following those topographic features in the in, in the bathymetry. And these this these uh, locations and times of um, um, residency shown in the red circles here uh, correspond with high seafloor topo topographic variation. And so the, the next variable is uh, sea ice concentration. Sea ice concentration is shown in this, the background here where we have high sea, sea ice concentration in the white and then out at the margin, we have reduced sea ice concentration. And this red line is the sort of the midwinter, June, July, August, 90% um, isopleth of the utilization distribution, illustrating sort of the concentrated use uh, area over the midwinter. And these individuals in the midwinter where they're exhibiting this residency behavior are experiencing about 85 to 90 percent sea ice concentration. That seems to be the sweet spot of um, where they're, they're um, accepting high ecosystem productivity and sea ice and daylight sort of meeting all those, those demands. So daylight, if we look at daylight over that midwinter period from say mid-May, um, where they may be experiencing three to five hours of, of daylight to middle of the midwinter, maybe mid-June through, through Ju mid-July, they're experiencing less than one hour to two hours of daylight and then of course, it subsequently increases after that. So to um, begin to, to wrap up a little bit even, um, this, this, um, this red line again is the midwinter 90% isopleth. And in this area from, from the colonies from Cape Adair down to Ross Island, there are probably about 4 million birds, breeding birds and non-breeding birds that aggregate in this area over winter. And they won't be uniformly distributed over this area. So they'll be, con they'll be aggregated in those sweet spots or those high preferred spots that combine high ecosystem productivity, adequate daylight, and 
the right amount of sea ice concentration. And so there's gonna be a lot of competition for re space and resources going on here during that time. And if there were changes in the, the ecosystem productivity due to fisheries or, um, or ice conditions due to climate change, we would expect to see changes in the, the movement behavior and or the survival of, of birds over, over winter. Now this isopleth is probably um, biased towards the birds from Cape Bird because we only again had 14 birds from Cape Adair. So of course, if we had more birds from Cape Adair, this would probably expand way out much greater this way. So I, I, I don't know much about the history of the MPA and why these zones were drawn the way they were, but it is interesting that the Adelie penguins from um, Ross Island and, and Cape Adair are, their, their overwinter movement really corresponds with the, the MPA, with perhaps I mean, you've got this focal point around this general protection zone up here, but this suggests that this general protection zone is probably too small. Um, but yeah, so, and these, these concentrated areas of use are again, a, um, a combination of finding the right combinations of sea ice concentration, bathymetry or ecosystem productivity, daylight. And they're also influenced by, of course, the, the sea currents. So I'd just like to finish by acknowledging the funding for this project in New Zealand and all my um, co-authors and uh, additional collaborators. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. That was great. Once again, uh, does anyone have questions for Dean? Uh, again, you can raise your hand at the bottom of the screen. You can type a question in the Q&A or in the chat box as well. We do have plenty of time for questions if anybody has them. So I have kind of a silly one, Dean. Um, yep. You were showing the trajectories of swimming and then uh, you know the speeds of the, of the currents and then you overlaid the, the different hotspots. And I'm kind of just curious, how difficult is it for the birds to actually stay in those hotspots given the, given the speed of the currents and things at those particular spots? Like, is it really difficult to do, do you think? Yeah, I think that the sea currents comes out quite quite um, important, and some of those sea currents, I think, are um, or those residency periods are actually there's sort of these eddy formations, larger eddy formations mm -hmm. that okay. help them stay in a particular area. So yeah, yeah. Otherwise, yeah, I think the sea currents would probably be important, but that's I haven't actually quantified that. Thank you. Uh, and then Akinori is asking, um, what do you mean by ecosystem productivity? Oh, well, um, it's yeah, that's a generic sort of usage to just, um, where there's high ecosystem productivity, there's gonna be high prey biomass for the, um, um, for, the, for the penguins. So perhaps high chlor chlorophyll in the ocean, which leads to a high um, krill and fisheries abundance in, in those particular areas. Great, thank you. Um, and I think that's all the time we have for questions. So thanks again, Dean. And last but not least, certainly, we will now turn the floor over to Rose. Here, Michelle, I'll just share my screen. Ready. Oh, just had an hour and a half listening to everyone's amazing presentations. 
getting really nervous. So let's hope I do okay. <laughs> um, kia ora everyone, my name is Rose. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Canterbury. Uh, and today I am talking to you about one of the chapters of my PhD, which is looking at the fine scale foraging behaviors of lactating Riddell seals in Erebus Bay, Antarctica. So this work is um, uh, in collaboration with the Ross Ramp team, which is looking at the effectiveness of the Ross Sea MPA. And um, I've been lucky enough to analyze some of their data for a chapter of my PhD. Um, and along with my co-authors, we've currently got a manuscript in review at Marine Ecology Progress Series. So I thought I'd take this opportunity to sort of give you a highlights reel of what we did and some of the coolest results that we found. Um, if you want more information about um, some of the interpretation of those results and um, more in-depth analysis, then please keep an eye out for our paper. So the objectives of our work was to understand the prey targeted by lactating Waddell seals in Erebus Bay. And we wanted to know the depths at which they were um, traveling to and where they were finding their prey. We also wanted to investigate possible factors that might correlate with foraging effort during lactation and we tagged seals at six locations in Erebus Bay to answer those questions. So Erebus Bay is in the southeastern McMurdo Sound, just on Ross Island. Uh, we tagged seals at Pram Point, uh, Hutton Cliffs, North Base, Turks Head, Big Razorback and Tent Island. For the animal tagging, we tagged 26 lactating Waddell seals for approximately five days in November and December of 2018 and 19. We, uh, while the animals were anesthetized, we took a number of biometric measurements from them, including their mass, girth, and length. And we also had access to a data set provided by the NSF funded project B009 by Jay Rotella and Bob Garrett looking at, and so we had access to the age of the females we were tagging, as well as the age of their pup and their breeding history. So the average mass of the females that we tagged was 312 kilos. They each had a pup ranging in age from 16 days up to 37 days old. And we had a range of breeding histories where we had a few seals who it was their first ever pup. And then we had one seal who had had, who had, had nine pups previously. For the tags, we used um, cameras attached to the heads of each seal. We also attached a magnetometer to the upper back. And um, this recorded depth, speed, et cetera. And then the seals tagged in 2018 had an accelerometer placed underneath their jaw to detect mouth opening movements, as well as to record depth as well. From there, we retrieved 26 videos to analyze and I chose to use the behavioral analysis software called Boris to do this um, analysis. Um, firstly, oh, you install the Boris program, you then upload your video into the software. You can then define an ethogram. So an ethogram is a list of behaviors that you want to quantify. We chose behaviors based on our research questions. So looking at the foraging behavior, as well as behaviors we expected to see with a wet owl seal um, mother looking after her pup. Some of these behaviors included interacting with her pup, showing aggression to conspecifics, uh, resting and foraging. And these behaviors could either be state events or point events. So a state event occurs, um, has a start time and an end time. And Boris then records how much time each seal spent displaying those behaviors. Whereas a point event occurs once and then stops. And Boris tells you how many times that behavior was observed. Uh, we could then add more detail to these behaviors by using modifiers. So for example, if the seal was interacting with her pup, we could then um, quantify whether that was occurring on the ice um, under the water or at the surface. And this was especially useful for the prey encounters. So I could um, identify the prey that was taken in those encounters, and that would be recorded into the Boris um, program. So this is a example of what the screen looks like in Boris. Um, on the left hand side, you've got an ethogram, which is um, the list of behaviors. Uh, the key refers to the key that you press on your keyboard when you observe that behavior to log it into the timeline. The subjects are the seals um, that we used. This is seal 1940. Um, she's currently at the surface. She's just taken a breath. She will then dive down, begin swimming and searching. 
and during that searching period she will encounter an ice fish and she will eat the ice fish. Another um, output of the Boris program is um, this timeline. So this is for seal 1930. She was one of our most prolific foragers. The um, sections in pink here are her um, foraging belt. And you can see in these four periods here is when she encountered most of her prey. So she would come to the surface, have a few breaths, and then go foraging. She ate mostly um, crustaceans, which was really interesting. She would come back up, take a few more breaths, and then travel back down again. And she, we also recorded uh, her interacting with her pup, as well as um, showing aggression to conspecifics, and then also resting on the surface as well. Uh, once I had finished the um, dive of the Boris analysis, I then moved on to analyzing the TDR data, which is time depth recorder data, gathered using both the jaw tag and the back tag. And I chose to use dive move and R to analyze these data. We um, determined that if the seal was deeper than 10, meet, 10 meters for longer than 30 seconds, it was considered that she was diving. And from there, we could then extract the overall dive statistics. So the maximum depth breached by any of our seals was 449 meters, and the maximum duration of any of those dives was 31 minutes. We also um, could look at the number of dives each seal did. And for one seal who was her tag was operational for 120 hours, within that period she completed 680 dives, but the majority of those, approximately 550 of those, were uh, shallow dives. So less than 50 meters, and the maximum deep dives any seal did was 198 dives across 120 hours. We could then combine the data sets using the TDR and the Boris prey um, encounters and plot them to determine the depths at which our prey encounters occurred. Uh, so this is an example of that with using the same seal as the previous slide. Uh, so you can see she was at the surface, she would then dive down, eat all the crustaceans, travel back up and continue that for four consecutive dives. And I really like this because in the first, in the previous slide, it's sort of like a 2D view of what she was doing, but it's quite hard to see exactly what's going on in the camera. And when you use both these tools together, you can see that she's actually diving down to nearly 450 meters below the surface and then continuing to return back to those same depths um, every time. The, the seal was the most prolific crustacean predator. She ate 257 crustaceans across those four dives. She caught 81 in her first dive and averaged approximately one crustacean every five seconds at a mean depth of 413 meters. So we think she was um, traveling, she located a swarm or shoal of crustaceans and then continued to travel back to that area to keep feeding them. Moving on to some of the results. So of the 26 seals that we tagged, we had 17 that were recorded diving and nine of those were recorded encountering prey on um, video. So we, in total, we recorded 848 different prey encounters. And this plot here is looking at the percent total of the prey encounters recorded, prey encountered, prey encounters recorded. <laughs> <laughs> and the most common being crustaceans, which was really unexpected. We thought um, silverfish would be the most common prey that we would observe, uh, but crustaceans occurred in 46% of the encounters. And the number at the top here refers to the number of seals that ate each prey group. So five seals ate crustaceans. Um, unknown were prey that we couldn't determine the species or type due to image quality or camera angle. And the next most common after that was um, Pleurogamma antarcticum or Antarctic silverfish. Uh, so now I thought I'd just show you some videos of the prey encounters. So this here is a seal. I hope it's not too laggy. This here is a seal swimming through a shoal of crustaceans. Um, we sent a subset of images through to our colleagues at NEWA and they were identified to be a range of different creatures, uh, including amphipods as well as some prawns and the majority of them were determined to be mice and shrimp. Uh, we also recorded a number of silverfish um, encounters. The seal here is swimming through a shoal of silverfish. Uh, and I really like 
that's again proving the usefulness of combining both of the TDR and video methods. When um, looking at just the video, you can't see uh, exactly what's going on, but when plotted against the TDR, you can see that seal was actually swimming upwards. She was ascending through the water column and eating silverfish on the way up. Um, this has previously been um, attributed to using the surface backlighting to identify their prey. Uh, excitingly, we also saw two encounters involving Antarctic toothfish. So these were identified by um, Professor Joseph Eastman, and they were determined to be uh, juveniles, approximately 50 centimetres in length. They were both taken by one seal that was tagged at Pram Point. So if you remember the map, Pram Point was the most farthest removed from the main breeding area. And the seal also had the oldest pup of our study population as well. Uh, we recorded a bunch of other encounters, including two octopus, which was really cool watching a widow seal trying to wrangle octopus. It was, took a while to figure out what was going on. Um, we also recorded a number of bork um, encounters, uh, which were taken just below the ice, as well as um, some crocodile ice fish and some miscellaneous creatures. Like I believe this is a, a feather star, possibly. Moving on to the correlation analyses, we found that we found a significant correlation between the, num the age of the female's pup and her foraging effort, as well as breeding history. So females that had older pups foraged more than females with younger pups, which is what we expected based on the literature. And but unexpectedly, we found a strongly negative correlation between the number of dives a female did and, the, and her breeding history. So females with fewer previous pups dove more than those with more experience. Uh, we found no relationship between the female's age, fatness or mass, however. And we also excitingly observed this new behavior that we haven't been able to find in any literature. If anyone has seen this before, we'd love to hear from you. So this is widow seals foraging for prey inside the cavity of glass sponges. Uh, so this occurred five times by three different seals. Two seals did it once, and one seal did it three times in a row. The seal, you can see she travels directly towards the sponge. She pushes her head into it. And then when she pulls out her head, she's very clearly chewing on something. I would love to know what she found in there or and how common a behavior this is, whether it is um, just uh, site specific. All, all three females that did it were tagged at different locations. Um, but yeah, we'd love to know how widespread this is. We also yeah, observed this. Okay. We also observed this seal who was interacting with her pup while it foraged within a sponge. So she travels down from the surface, uh, locates her pup on the seafloor, gives it a nudge, and then rests beside it while it continues to forage in the sponge. Now this is a screenshot of that interaction. That's her pup here. And this seal um, had the camera attached to her cheek, which we were hoping to be able to determine what the prey type. Um, another behavior that we observed, it's the same seal as the previous slide, um, encounters a bork as she re-enters the water from up on the ice. She chews on it a few times and then lets it go. She recaptures it and then lets it go once more, possibly playing with her prey or not hungry at the moment. We're not sure exactly, but again, this is one of the benefits of putting cameras on seals. You see things that you might not be able to see otherwise. Uh, so, uh, I want to say a huge thank you to everyone who had any part in this publication and um, this research and for letting me be involved in such a fun project. Um, there's been a huge collaborative effort internationally to get um, to us to where we are at the moment. And if you have any questions, please reach out and please keep an eye out for our paper. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rose. Very nice presentation. Um, all right. We have about a minute for questions. Uh, does anyone have questions for Rose? Oh, got a couple, perfect. <laughs> Would you like to read those, Rose? Yes. Can you see the Q&A? Okay. Yes. 
Um, someone says, curious about some of your new findings. What are your theories on why seals with less children dive more? Um, interesting wording. Um, but we are currently looking at um, the different locations in Erebus Bay are known to host different levels of experience and each um, there's some theories about prey distribution and um, the symmetry within across those different locations and we're currently working on that in the revisions of our paper um, but we're still sort of scratching the surface of it and there's a whole lot more um, unanswered questions here that we're really excited to explore. And Manuel says, great talk Rose, some within species of the genus Trimatomus use sponges to lay their eggs. They may be foraging for these fishes, just a thought. Yeah, that is awesome and so exciting and so interesting. And one of the um, highlights of putting cameras on seals is just seeing things that you might not see. So we'd love to um, explore that more as well. And we've got a question from Dong Yun Han. Hi. Hi, I'm Dong Yun Han uh, from Korea Polar Research Institute. Uh, I'm interested in the vocalization of the weather seal and kind of that kind of that. Uh, I wonder the is is there a, a dire or a seasonal or annual patterns of the vocalization of weather seal? Do you uh, know about I, that? I haven't explored that but I have we did quantify the seals vocalizing in the video based on their head movement so we didn't have um, microphones on on the cameras but you could tell that a seal was vocalizing because they have this really distinctive sort of bobbing thing going on as they were um, making noise uh, but I don't know personally about that but I'm sure maybe someone else in the audience might or uh, yeah thank you Great, thank you. So I think that's all the time we have for questions. Um, I see there is another Q&A, so I'll let Rose go ahead and, and answer that question uh, on her own. But um, I just wanted to uh, thank all of the speakers and thank all of the attendees for um, joining us here at the um, SCAR Birds and Marine Mammals session. And I just wanted to also remind everybody that we have yet another session tomorrow, August 3rd at 1300 UTC. So I hope to see you all there. Um, I hope you guys all enjoyed this as much as I did. Um, and again, once again, thank you so much. And if you have any other questions for the speakers, please do feel free to reach out to them directly. Have a great day, everybody. <laughs>